you know, at the end of the day, human beings are, are social beings. And, you know, in varying, in varying degrees, we all crave that, that social connection. And so that's why this is, this is so hard. But it's, you know, what you've got to realise is it's harder for some more than others. Be, and, 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 and that extroversion, introversion continuum is very important to understand because the extroverted people are more emotional. They crave social interactions. We have the pleasure of welcoming you, Massey, today to our interview series. I'm Vanessa Rose from the People Hum Group. Let's begin with just a quick introduction of People Hum. People Hum is an end to end, one view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for ACM that is specifically built for the crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Hugh Massey is the Chairman and CEO of DNA Behaviour. He is a well-renowned keynote speaker and an author of Leadership Behaviour DNA, discovering your natural talents and managing differences. Specialities include behaviour insights, design of innovative behaviour management solutions, Behavior in finance, at risk profiling, business mentoring, communication, and human capital management. We're extremely happy to have someone of this stature on our interview series today. Welcome to you. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you, Vanessa. It's great to be with you. The first question I have for you here was Can you tell us a little bit about your journey that brought you to DNA Behavior? So I've had a very different journey. Many would expect someone who's running a behavioral company to be a psychologist. And I'm not. I'm actually a CPA or for people from uh, English-based countries, a chartered accountant by, by original training. And I was in the management of one of the large chartered accounting firms for, for 10 years in, in Sydney, Australia uh, and Southeast Asia. And then I left in the mid-90s and set up a wealth management business. And it was there in dealing with people's money, I started to see that there were different behaviours when people were under pressure. And that got me to realise that when I was helping people with their money and with their lives, and sometimes, you know, I was their mentor as well, I was helping them with their career, that there was, a, that there was more than just the money issues going on, it was actually behavior. And I could see that people, Vanessa, behave differently under pressure. And so I wanted to know what that was. And so I hired a uh, industrial psychologist to come and work in our wealth management business. And she confirmed my theories about the fact that people have this natural instinctive behavior that they're born with that's shaped uh, by the time they're three years old, so it's your genetics plus your first three years of your life. And I thought, okay, that's what I need to know. If I'm going to advise people, whether it's with their money, in their life, I need to know that. And so that then brought me to America, to Atlanta, Georgia, where I now live. And this is nine, you know, this happened 19 years ago when I first came across the ideas. And uh, my, my uh, industrial psychologist in Australia, Carol Pocklington, introduced me to a man here in Atlanta called Lee Ellis. And he helped validate the theories that I had. He was very experienced in this. He did a lot, a lot, did a lot of work with the US Air Force um, and, 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 and in other fields. And so we formed a partnership. And, and, and that really took me on the journey. And step by step, I learned it. And, you know, I started to facilitate boards of companies, uh, large consulting groups, financial planning, wealth management firms, you know, all over the globe, and we build a system. And that's, you know, effectively I bankrolled it, came up with the ideas, bankrolled it, got it all validated, and 19 years later, this is where I sit, you know, uh, you know, running this business, never been happier in my life. And also, you know, through that journey, learned a lot about leadership itself. And what's important to be a leader and and you know i'm involved on the leadership of other organizations other than my own business and 
you know, that gives me experiences as well. So that's really my, if that gives you a good idea to the pathway. But, but I think it's also important for Vanessa, for the listeners to understand, in a way, I went through an about shift, if you, if you want to call it that, from being a chartered accountant to a behavioural specialist or a behavioural insights pioneer, as I would term myself now. But it was out of my uh, deeper purpose of wanting to help people become self-empowered. And that was the crux of it. And when I realised what helping people become self-empowered was, is about understanding themselves, who they are at the core, what their strengths and talents are, what their struggles are, and being able to use that to take responsibility to grow their own lives. That, that was really the, uh, the foundation and the gift. And, you know, building the system in a way has been something that uh, is something that sits on top of that. That means I can do it on a scalable basis to help many people globally become self-empowered. Yeah, this is so, that is so interesting. Behavior is really at the core of how people operate. And to be able to understand that, it's really nice. I, I believe behavior is at the center of, of everything. And, you know, it's wrapped up in the decisions we make. The decisions we make reflect the core of who we are. And, you know, it's something that's not, it's still not addressed enough in leadership. I, I don't believe, you know, I, 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 I sit on boards of, of groups, I facilitate groups, and I think not enough people know where the others in the room are coming from and what their perspectives are. And that's what leads to a lot of lack of trust, conflicts, uh, and, you know, and problems. We don't know in the workforce enough about who each other are on a real-time basis. And, and if you can do, if you can understand who they are, then you, you, you can accept them for who they are and you can uh, have greater respect. Because when respect is lost, that's a big problem. You know, if the respect is lost by the leader for a teammate, that's a problem. If a teammate doesn't respect his or her leader, that is a problem. Yeah, that is so true. We don't really understand each other anymore. We're just, you know, working together, but we don't know what's going on with the other person. We don't communicate enough. And, 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 and in this digital world we're in right now, which has been growing, you know, and I'm sure, you know, you're doing a lot of work in that area, but we're also now, more of us are working at home. You know, I've got my employees um, in, 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 for my business are in 11 different countries, you know, but we've been working more virtually for a while, although we have offices, but we've been working as a virtual team for a while. But, you know, one of the things is that we've learned over the last five or six years how to engage people in that environment and now many have got to learn it because this is going to be the new world of more people working at home and it's a huge challenge for leaders and 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 and, and, and you've got to understand as a leader the behavior of every person on your team because for some are going to need even more engagement and connection in this environment not less but the environment means we can't see each other each day and feel each other touch each other what, what exactly is behaviorally smart leadership? And do you believe in the concept of born leader? So I'll answer them separately, Vanessa, because I, I, although they're, they're somewhat wrapped up together, the, you know, in, in terms of behaviorally smart leadership, to me, that is about understanding the human differences. So for, for a leader to have the awareness and the knowledge to understand how to manage him or herself and the different people on the team because it's the differences that get people into trouble. It causes the conflicts, uh, unused um, talents means, you know, lack of productivity. So, so a behaviourally smart leader knows how to manage differences. But, you know, there's several pillars to this. First is the the behaviorally smart leader will be able to capitalize on strengths of every person in the team, including their own, and be able to manage the struggles. And, and so that's important, including their own struggles. You know, and the struggles are a flip side of the strengths in a way they think of it as a strength overused. If, if, if you're 
uh, strength is communication and being engaging people in a communicative setting. The struggle is you can talk too much and, and disengage or annoy people from doing that. Uh, you could be very well organised, but maybe, you know, there's a time to be not as well organised and be more intuitive and spontaneous. So, you know, one overplayed, the strength overplayed becomes a struggle. So you've got to understand that, that tension that exists all the time. The second is what I call the platinum rule of being able to adapt your communication and style to each person. You know, uh, if, if you and I were working together, we, we are different people. I would need, uh, just aside from the cultural difference, I would need, I would need to uh, know how, what your style is, Vanessa, to, to be able to reach into you and adapt myself to engage you and communicate on your terms. And it might be, you know, Hugh is very a naturally goal-driven, direct person um, to the point, but that's not what you might need in the moment. I might need to be able to have to uh, listen more, be more empathetic, connect to your feelings. Um, or I've got to realise that somebody on the team is an extreme innovator. And how do I manage that talent and, 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 and work with that? But, communi but, but communication is very important and adapting to how the other person wants to be communicated with and treated is important. The third level is then really uh, uh, about emotional intelligence, which is you know, building on the first two. In, um, you know, obviously that will, not obviously, but that starts off with a heightened awareness of yourself and then the ability to manage and relate to others. And, and, and so, you know, having a heightened level of emotional intelligence is absolutely crucial if you're going to be a behaviorally smart leader. And, and that, that's the part that needs, you know, some development work. Uh, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all born with a style, but we've got, we've got to do some learning to adapt to others, um, be more socialized. Uh, in terms of, you know, is a leader born? or made, I suppose. I, I think the way I would address that question and put it back to people to consider is every person has the traits inside them to be a great leader, regardless of their style. But it just might be that they have to do some hard work to learn what those traits are to deploy them in leadership. Now, I would say being personal. When I was younger, I didn't perceive myself as a leader. I certainly was not made a leader at the school I had or, uh, you know, early on. But once I got into the working workforce environment and my confidence grew, I got into leadership positions pretty early on. And so... That, that grew me as a leader. Sometimes I was a reluctant leader, but the more I've learned about myself, then I've become an entrepreneur. I'm leading a business. I'm now on the board of some global organizations and bigger businesses. With, with greater confidence and awareness of myself, I've allowed the innate leadership talents inside me to flourish. I, I've learned the environments that I can lead well in and there are other environments I'm not suited to. So I also do believe that each person does have those traits inside them. Are they prepared to learn them and maybe do the, do the work to, uh, uh, to become a leader? Now, some people, they just naturally fall into it and, it, and it just, the world just opens up a little bit. Others have to do a bit of work uh, at it. And for others, it's situational. You know, that there are... Uh, you know, not at, when we're not all equipped to be the leader of every type of business. You know, there are some businesses and organisations or times in the evolution of a business where, 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 where we might be better equipped. So I, I do believe at the foundation, it's, you're born with it. Um, those traits that I'm talking about, you are born with. It, 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 you are then put on this earth in a way to go and discover what they are and learn how to work with them. That's where the learning comes in is to, to find out what they are and then know how to adapt them, which is, again, is being behaviorally smart for the setting that you're in to become the leader. And then after that, it's, a lot of it's about confidence. And I think 
you know, we, we do a lot of uh, work in coaching leaders in our, in, in our business. And, 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 and I believe, uh, you know, if you put character on the side, on one side, you know, character and ability to make wise decisions, which are foundational. If you haven't got that, you haven't got anything. But after that, it's about confidence. And that's why it's important to nurture confidence in people, uh, ensure yourself that you don't lose your own confidence. You know, when that's starting to wane, you've got to, you know, whether you get coaching, support, mentoring, sounding boards. You know, I'm, I'm a member of Entrepreneurs Organization, which is a global uh, group really for entrepreneurial leaders, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, experience. But in there, we are coaching each other, helping each other rise up, being a sounding board. And a lot of that, at the end of the end of the day, is to keep your confidence when when you distill it down, and that and that's what every leader, you know, has to do. But you have to do it for yourself. But you've also got to do it for your team. Your team have got to be confident as well if they're going to grow. That was so insightful. So you're saying no one is actually born a leader, but they're born with traits, and it's their job to actually identify it and work on it. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're born with the traits and you can use them to become the leader. Okay. So, moving on to our next question. Um, with respect to your behavioral insights, how would you advise a new entrepreneur to, you know, succeed? Well, it, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it, 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 it's a wonderful question and we, we did, uh, Vanessa, some research on this two or three, two years ago, 2017, so August 2017, we did some, we did a research study of 500 successful entrepreneurs and, and they had built a business at least of a million dollars and going up past 10. And you know, so a segment of them had pretty big businesses. The number one trait for all of them uh, was, was resilience. And so... To be successful as an entrepreneur, you need to be resilient. And, you know, you know resilience means uh, lots of different things. People have written books about it and sort of described it as grit. Um, there's, a, there's an element of uh, mental toughness. But I would also say that there is a, a, a part of that is also being emotionally strong and balanced. Because at the end of the day, the resilience person resilient person is able to take the knockdown that's going to come as an entrepreneur. You're going to get plenty of them and, and rise back up again. You know, it, 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 it's something happens. You've got to dust yourself off. Um, you know, uh, what I call stop yourself uh, before you wreck yourself, you know, check yourself a little bit. And, and move on and accept the situation and, and, that, you, and that you're going to learn from it. You know, I've, in, 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 in my sort of 25, 25 or 24 years of being a, uh, an entrepreneur, I've, I, I've had all sorts of situations that, I, that, are, that are in some ways inconceivable. And some of them have been, you know, quite threatening. But, you know, you've, you've got to be able to, to see what the silver lining is in that uh, uh, and, 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 and how you can grow out of that experience, even if it's not fun. And I think that's the first thing for an entrepreneur. And, and, and you've got to realize going into becoming an entrepreneur, these things are going to happen. Um, and you know, not, not to get bitter about it. It's just, it's just a fact of life. And, and I believe how you handle adversity will determine your success at the end of the day. And that, that, that's something that's important. But that, you know, one of the next tra traits is the second trait actually is risk taking. So you have got to be able to handle risk and, and, and have the tolerance for what happens if something doesn't work out. Because as you build the business from zero to a million dollars to $10 million and upwards, there will always be some level of betting the farm with the business. You, you, you're always going to have to take risks. There's going to be inflection points. The COVID-19 crisis right now is going to put a lot of business owners at a point of taking some risk somewhere, um, you know, in, in how they pivot their business. So that leads me into the third one, which is innovation. You, you definitely have got to be prepared to innovate and back innovation. And, and that's something that's very important. You know, in today's world, business models change, let's say, every three to five years. 
so the world changes with technology. There's a lot of things that change very fast. And at, at, at really at an, at an unprecedented pace, you know, whereas 20 years ago or even 40 or 50 years ago, things might have taken 10 or 15 years for there to be a fundamental change. You could sort of see it coming and then it, it, it came and it keeps coming. Today, it's bang. And, you know, the COVID-19 crisis was really, for a lot of us, in a matter of days, you know, and, 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 and but you're out there, the CEO, founder of a business, you've got to take that, you've got to deal with that, you've got to deal with your people, you've got to stay balanced, but you've also got to look at, there is an opportunity here. There's, you know, all right, there will be some businesses that are uh, maybe permanently damaged, but there's opportunities to pivot there. So you've got to be thinking innovate, innovatively. Um, you've got to be adaptable yourself, but you've got to have some people like that on your team. You know, and then, and then, and then after that comes, uh, you know, what we would call having a growth mindset. So you, you've got to, I think you've always got to be prepared to be growing and keep on growing. Uh, so that's, that's an important one. You know, that in our, in our behavioral traits, that's being a pioneer. That's really the goal setting type person. And, and you've got to be pretty persistent, competitive, want to work hard. And, and then the final one is you, you've got to have, you've got to have charisma. And, and, and that's really coming from uh, being, being, being uh, prepared to project yourself out there and put yourself um, out there in the world. Now, not all of us who are successful entrepreneurs have all five of those. But I would say the first one, the resilience is absolutely important. And then one of the other four are, are key. Um, you know, I've seen some entrepreneurs succeed just straight out on being innovative. And that's their primary trait and they've done it from that. Others, it's, it's from hard work. Others, it's, you know, being charismatic and selling, you know, selling an idea. I think it a little bit depends on the business, the settings. If you can have all five, that's great. And, 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 and the bigger the business gets, it's more and more important that all those five traits are there. Yeah. Resilience really does matter in, terms, in times of adversity. So how do you think your new age leaders can you know, adapt to it, right? Especially with the remote working and stuff like that. How, how can the leaders adapt? adapt yes. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think in the, uh, uh, in, in the current setting, for leaders, when there's pressure, particularly for for some leaders that are more introverted, it's easy to withdraw and be disengaged, you know, and, and, and withdraw from the situation in a way a little bit disengaged from your team and work alone. That that part's easy for an introverted person. In a way, this, this COVID-19 crisis to some degree, it's been an introvert's paradise. And I've made that joke to people because I'm very introverted and I'm quite comfortable working at home. I've got, you know, a whole floor of my house set up as an office and all the facilities, even though we have an office. This is easy for me, all the technology's there. But the part that's important is to understand in, 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 in these difficult times, when you've got all of your employees at home as well, and if they're extroverted, they need an even higher level of engagement. And there needs to be even more communication. You know, we talk about as leaders, communicate, communicate, and over-communicate. Well, we can put the over-communicate multiples up. It needs to be a lot more of it. Now, I'm lucky in my team, I've got someone uh, who, who works with me really as the president of the company on a day-to-day -day basis, Leon, and he does a lot of that. He, he, he would reach out to every person on the team would get a personal phone call or an interaction several times a week. Um, so it's, it, it, we're there the whole time. The meeting cadence, it's not necessarily long meetings, but the meeting cadence is set up for that. We know what everybody's doing and we understand them, you know, what's driving them so that they can still get the love, if you want to call it that, remotely to get the help. That, 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 that's what's important. You know, because there are others as well that like to do their work collaboratively and you've got to provide that environment online. Um, you know, luckily we've got Zoom, makes it easier and there are other uh, tools as well, uh, you know, like Microsoft Teams and same page and whatnot. 
um, you know, to, 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 to use, you know, but this is what's important uh, to uh, building that collaboration. That's, that's very important, you know, so, um, and, I, and, and, you know, and I know that you would be working on this as a company as well, you know, is, is how do you get every, keep, the, keep the whole workforce engaged? And, 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 but, the, but, the, but the leaders have got to step outside of themselves to do that. So it's more of making them feel involved and secure and safe, especially in crisis like this. You've got, you've got to keep people involved. Uh, that's what, you know, at the end of the day, human beings are, are social beings. And, you know, in varying, in varying degrees, we all crave that, that social connection. And so that's why this is, this is so hard. But it's, you know, what you've got to realise is it's harder for some more than others. Be, and, 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 and that extroversion, introversion continuum is very important to understand. Because the extroverted people are more emotional, they crave social interactions. Uh, you know, that's also a risk as well. If they start to break the rules of lockdown to connect with people and get sick, that's also another issue. So you've got to, you've got to make sure no one's going, you know, driving themselves up the wall um, at home. Have, have Zoom, have, you know, Zoom cocktail hours. Zoom exercise hours. You know, this afternoon I'll be doing, you know, a group exercise program with a group of people, just to just to, with other some other leaders. You know, we'll we'll all be riding, um, you know, Peloton bikes at home, but online and connecting with each other. That's all part of the uh, the engagement that's needed. Um, do that with your team. Uh, you know, show. You know, one of the things we do is we 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 get everyone to show something of their personal life or their home life to the team just to just to get engaged you know as i said you can you can do music parties online there's a lot of ways to engage people now that really sounds fun you got to try <laughs> so do you see an evolution in organization culture over the years and what according you to you is the ideal of this culture so you know, the evolution that I've been seeing, Vanessa, is, you know, when, when I started at, uh, in, in the workforce, which is probably 35 years ago or so now, um, and I think it was probably worse, this part was worse before even I got to the workforce, but I think we've moved from a, a command and control workplace has is, is, is been the transition more to a, a much more team-based, collaborative uh, approach. Um, you know, we're we're in that world now where um, the leader will get the opinions of everybody on the team, and it might even be a little bit too much. I, I do believe we've moved the right way to team first, and that's probably the, that's the world we're in. So if I sort of keep it simple, command and control to a team first type model. But then how the team is managed and how you run that team first model is very important for the leader, you know, to, uh, you know, in a way crowdsource or team source the decision making to some degree, but the decision's got to get made. You can't, you can't leave the team just having great discussions, evaluating ideas, and then at the end of the day, no, no decision is made. So the facilitation skills of the leader are... are are very important to ensure that the team is nevertheless led through that 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 process, and it's not just a free for all inside the team. There's still people still want leadership, and there's still got to be a guiding hand somewhere. But I think that's the big evolution that I've seen in terms of uh, how how uh, businesses are managed. You know. Uh, I, I, I do it that way. I, I let the executive team, you know, I throw out the ideas if I see them or they bring them to me. We discuss it at a high level. They go away and do research, put together a paper. Um, they know from my communication style, I like to have options. I won't make a decision without what the op without knowing the options. It's just like a big no-no for me. Um, they've seen it happen. I'll say no 80% of the time if the options aren't put in front of me. 
put in front of me, a decision gets made in five minutes. But then everybody's been involved. If you do that the right way, everybody's been included. And sometimes, you know, you take a choice and you massage it and make it a bit better. And then, and, and then the decision gets made and then, and then you go and live with the decision. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's what's important um, to, you know, as, as a leader to ensure that that's what happens. But it's also important that me as the leader, and even though I'm the founder of the business and the chief check writer, uh, you know, that I'm not, I'm not gate crashing the party and just inserting my will into everything because I'll never grow other leaders in the business if I do that the team will never be empowered. They've got to have a role. They've got to have a role too and grow. And in fact, the more I allow that to happen, even if we make a mistake, the better, be, the better off I am because I'm then more freed up to be what I'm great at. So, so it's, it's not good for, for anyone, whether it's a major corporation or an entrepreneurial business for it to be over command and control. That, that's, that, 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 that micromanagement type approach becomes a problem later. Because if you're the entrepreneur, you never get outside of your own business if, you, if, if that's what happens. And, 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 and also you disenfranchise all of the team and you'll never really keep a solid team. Do you think people want to be, people who don't want to be controlled with rules and all, but they still need a figure to you know, make decisions? And yeah, they, they, they don't want to be controlled, but they need to be guided. And there needs to be clarity from from the leader. I don't believe in in the leader abdicating the throne. Um, you know, the the leader's got to take responsibility too, and that's a big part of leadership that I don't think gets talked enough about is taking responsibility. And 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 that's something that's very important. And if you're an entrepreneurial leader, you're taking responsibility for everything. The CEO of a company is taking responsibility, even if you don't know what's gone on because you can't know everything, but you're taking responsibility for what you don't know. And you've got to be prepared for that to happen if you're going to be a leader and if you want to grow as a leader. Absolutely, that's okay. So, Hugh, um, do you see the gig economy disrupting organizations set up that we have? I think the gig economy is going to be something that's big. And it's interesting, a few of the uh, businesses that use our systems, our DNA behavior systems, uh, with an API of them, are building platforms to serve the gig economy. And I see it as being very big for, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, one, because we're going to be a lot more working remotely. Uh, businesses aren't going to want to carry the headcount. We're in a, in a world of specialization. But also for the individual, it, it, it creates an opportunity for them to do what they love to do, to use their talents, leverage their experiences and knowledge on, uh, on their terms. You know, you can choose. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work two days a week and it's going to be at X price and this is what I'm going to do and the other five days I take off or I could work five days a week and I can do this. But you just concentrate, you know, in a way it's allowing, uh, it's a, allowing people who are certainly displaced from the workforce or don't find the current workforce structure to work, to go and get a role. I, I know in our business, at any time we would be using 10 or 15 people from the gig economy to do specialist projects for us. Because we know then that, that we're getting the specialist skill. Uh, and, but we don't have to retain the person full-time on the payroll. So I think there's a, it's going to work for the employer and it's going to work for uh, the employee or the, the person wanting to work in that environment. I just see it happening more and more. There will be more and more platforms that provide the opportunities. There are already a few. Uh, but... I, I think it's going to grow. And I think for a retired, for, for people that want to retire, you know, if you want to retire from full-time executive work or position, say in, in your, at 60 or in your early 60s, you got a long time left in your life and you need, I think most people need to do something meaningful. This provides an opportunity for that. But also financially, 
you know, people will retire thinking, okay, I need X dollars to retire on per year, but my uh, savings will only allow me to have Z dollars. There's a gap. And that's got to be funded. And so the gig economy, in a way, provides that avenue to do some part-time work, if you want to call it that, on their terms and make enough money to fill the gap up. So, so I, I, I think it's going to become uh, uh, a bigger thing, I think, for organisations in today's day and age, which have to be highly adaptable. You know, leaders have got to be adaptable. The organisation's got to be able to pivot quickly. Tapping into the gig economy is one way of uh, making that happen. I, I still think businesses need to retain a core headcount of key people, but the rest can, you know, the specialist help can come from the gig economy. So I think it's going to be big. Do you think most organizations are accepting of this culture? Because most employees, you know, they like having a hold over their employees. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, the organizations are, are, are accepting it more and more. And, you know, in a way, people, we've seen a trend of it already. People will leave a company, but they can be hired back as a consultant to do a project if they've got the, uh, you know, the talents and the skills to do it. They haven't, you know, burned a bridge. But it's also a way for a person to go out there and, you know, work with lots of different companies uh, from anywhere. And so I, 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 I do see this happening. And I think if, if people are going to live and work at home more and more, which, which I think is the trend, I think this COVID-19 crisis has brought it home that people want to work at home and not in an office. It's, it's only going to encourage the gig economy. Has really started people thinking to actually start something of their own. Yes. So, do you, do you have any last sound bites that you'd like to leave our audience with? Yeah, the, the you know the the final Vanessa the final sound bite would be above everything as a leader to think about your identity and how you want to show up to the world be seen and where's your impact going to be? Because that's really what your identity is. And, you know, that that does come from knowing your purpose and having alignment, you know, internally to who you are, what your talents are, your gifts, skills. But I think it goes a, lot of, a, a little bit beyond that in, in the sense that it, it, the identity comes from where you can have your greatest uh, impact and where you want to be seen. And, you know, I was tossing this around for myself last year where I'd always seen myself as a mentor to people. That's how I wanted to be remembered based on the concept of self-empowerment, really, because that was, that's what my purpose is. Well, my purpose hasn't changed about self-empowerment. But what I've really seen is that, you know, my greatest impact is around being a global insights pioneer and the development of more and more behavioural insights, operationalising them through uh, technology, you know, digitalising them into businesses. That's where my greatest impact is in the DNA business, but also in the business community. And and uh, you know, seeing you know, seeing those issues, and but 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 showing up as a leader uh, in it, of uh, human behaviour, behavioural insights, uh, uh, applying them. That's that's really where my where my identity uh, rests, and so I think for for other leaders and you know of any type of leader, and particularly if you're an entrepreneurial leader, thinking about your identity is important, and, and then it's putting it out there to some degree who you want to be, and then it's making sure every time you get out of bed each day that you are living up to that. And that's what's going to keep propelling you forward and making you better and making you grow. And, and that's, 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 what, that's what's important at the end of the day. And, and you know, and pe when people understand that and respect that for you, that defines your role in the business. You know, my role in DNA behaviour has been is defined by that now. My role or help with other organisations is defined by that. Uh, what you know, and, and so what I do each day is, is is defined by that. That I think that's also you know the way it, it, it helps set your own sandbox. This is very important if you're going to grow a business.
to, to, to know where you even as a leader fit in and, and what your uh, platform is going to be to, to run the company, manage the company and interface with the community. That is some real good advice. So it's being aware of yourself and knowing what you stand for. Yep. That's, that's, that's very important. You know, and related to that is we haven't used the word today, but values are important in there. I've talked about talents and purpose, but your values are important. But wrap that up in, in, in how you're going to show up out there in the world and how do you want others to see you. That's your identity. That's very important. Thanks for the really nice thoughts, you. I really had a nice time talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us. And Thank you, Vanessa. I'm sure our audience is going to enjoy this interview. Well, I, I appreciate being invited and I uh, hope it helps. Yeah, surely it will. I hope we stay in touch. Okay, thank you so much.